but I'll know at the end. Uh, this is um, November 1st. Uh, we're doing our first uh, show for the B-Side Arts Gallery and website, and its, its debut show is entitled Cartoon Sexy. And I'm glad to have all the artists on here to talk. And um, it's a pretty big week, elections this week, pretty uh, historic moment in time as well. And uh, it's a good time to have a show as always in the midst of chaos. Uh, and John, I'll let you start uh, talking because uh, oh. everyone else talks better than me, no doubt. <laughs> well, I was just gonna, we, we, a number of us know each other, but I was gonna give an intro to uh, Matt Myers, who I, I introduced to the group. And I, I met Matt, uh, I think through Facebook. Uh, and then we eventually met at a small show that I was at, but Matt um, uh, is a watercolorist. He went to Pratt. Uh, a number of years ago and has worked for a number of years as the doing AV audio and visual at Sotheby's. So he's a great person to hear some stories from about the workings of that fine institution. And also he's a wonderful person to give a heads up on when there's a great, great, some great paintings being shown. Mm -hmm. uh, but Matza does in incredible watercolors that for anybody who ever thinks of my work, it has an erotic side. I would say that it's my work feels like a nunnery compared to Matt's. So <laughs> that's my introduction for Matt. I uh, I really enjoy the watercolors and uh, never seen watercolors painted like that. It's almost like oil paint the way you layer. <clears throat> uh, and I'd like to talk to you about how you do it one day, but we won't get too too into far into it here. But really amazing work. I've never like detailed realism and watercolors like that is uh, I appreciate that astounding. it blew me away when I first saw it your work um but real quick on the on the the, the gallery itself um this is going to be the first of a few shows and we'll try to keep it rolling and we're I'm you know the website isn't quite up but it'll be up at the end of the week and um we'll have prints of all the work <laughs> and yeah I'd like to keep it going and keep adding work to it and you know, eventually like more individual, uh, I don't know how much we could put into the website, but it's gonna be uh, pretty, it, I'm gonna keep expanding it. And now's a good time for it because everyone's going digital and it's a good time for it. <clears throat> um, but I just wanted to say uh, thank, I wanted to thank you all for, uh, for, for being a part of this. And um, yeah, we're all New York artists here. As I was looking over everyone's bios, I'm realizing everyone's pretty much from New York except me and Isaac <laughs> and um, uh, and Antonia who, who, and they aren't here today, but Antonia is Greek from Athens and she's actually trapped in America right now. Hmm. Uh, but- um, And she lives from, is she lives in Athens or she lives here? Uh, her and her husband live here in, um, they're in Pennsylvania now, I, I believe. But yeah, they live in Athens and they came to visit and they got quarantined here. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I, I like to say, I like to say to people that, um, just an aside that Athens, uh, is, uh, I think currently pretty one of the hip, uh, maybe the hip, um, uh, European city. So I always tell people that they should check it out for a variety of reasons, but it is very, you know, very hip now. Costa, that's yeah. fun. that's fun. That my friends who live in Athens say the exact the two places now where a lot of artists are moving to, and a lot of a lot of art energy is Athens. Yeah, yeah. And then the other is in Portugal. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, definitely because I, I go to Athens. Uh, I go to Crete uh, uh, a lot because we have a house there, and you know. But I and then I stop in Athens, and I always I always go to the I always stop and uh, always go to the same hotel, Hotel Astor. And I try to get the same room with a balcony because I do this, uh, I'm doing these paintings overlooking, uh, looking at the roads leading up to the Acropolis. So, uh, oh, oh wow. Kind of, yeah, yeah. And after, after what, what happened is after the Olympics, mm -hmm. they built a metro and then widened these streets. And so I always say like there's these, they have beautiful, they have like about five to seven of these apexes around uh, city highest points that you could hike to and just, it, it's an incredible city. And anyway, yeah, that's just an aside. So I'm sorry she's not on. Anyway. That's, the one, that's the one city I haven't, one of the few yeah. cities I haven't been to yet in Europe, but I need to get out there. Uh, 
but back to the work. Um, uh, one common element I, I saw looking at everything was the high level of eroticism in a lot of it. Even uh, Antonia's, uh, I don't know if you saw the, some of the newer pieces I put up. She has two flies copulating. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, other than other than that, I, I found there was like a you know a strong like almost sense of anime. And I, I've talked to Zoila before about the differences because she was educating me about because I didn't know the differences between anime and like hente and uh, the third one is um what's the third one Zoila? Uh, I'm blanking too. Sorry. Yeah, but I, I noticed that was a strong Disney. <laughs> Disney's <the third. laughs> element in your work too, Matt, was the, uh, was the, like the Asian, uh, illustration type of influence. Mm -hmm. And, um, and along with influences as well was John's history as a colorist, John. Uh, yeah. Like for Marvel. Yep. Marvel and, and some DC and some independent, but year, years at Marvel as, their, an as a colorist. Route to have as a academic teacher and, uh, what, mm -hmm. what, specific comic books were they? I, never uh, I mean, I did a lot of Punisher, but I, I was really used, I was used through for all the, the regular Marvel titles, but where I was, I'm known for these days when I hear myself mention in podcasts, it's for uh, my graphic novels. So where I worked in gouache, which I'm now teaching also at the New York Academy of Art and CE, I always say it's my perfect uh, sketch medium because you can make lots of mistakes. So I colored a lot of comics in gouache and in watercolor, mm. Dr. Martin's dyes, mm. which are highly carcinogenic. Nobody uses those anymore. Oh, darn. Uh, but I didn't know before that. The, I'm sorry? I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's before the age of computer color, or it's right as the age of computer coloring was coming in. But mm. I, I did all my hand-painted stuff. You're, and you're when I was at about, Marvel, I'm you're sorry. You're talking about this stuff, right, John? <laughs> what stuff? He's got a He's bottle it. right there. Oh, right don't, here. Don't drink that. Oh, I, I didn't see. Yeah, it's worse than arsenic. Um, oh, it didn't, I didn't see what. Uh, it was. Would, would you have Dr. Martin's dyes? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's really poisonous stuff. Yeah, I won't let my cats <laughs> drink it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that goes right. Don't get on your skin. It goes right in. So back so, um, Oh, go ahead. No. So uh, I. It, but it was interesting because when I was in comics, you know, I really wanted to be a. I was really always said, well, I'm a fine artist. And even in the, uh, my office at Marvel, I had like my paintings up. I was so proud of being a fine artist and not in comics because I felt <laughs> the fine art was pure and <laughs> comic books were impure. And now that I'm older, I sort of, went, you know what? I still have a lot of friends in comics, you know, Walt Simonson and Bob Cam, all these people I'm still, you know, in touch with and <laughs> hang out with. And I actually find them really quite pure artistically even though their work is commercial and, and, you know, as you get older, you sort of sometimes realize that um, what you thought the fine art world was pure is actually, you know, impenetrable and corrupt and not every, not everything, but it's certainly not, I would never describe the art world as pure. And uh, I love the art world, but it's not pure. And the comic book world now I've, I've really grown to love and embrace. Um, that's and so I, I try and allow, I guess what I'm, the, the point being is there was a period in my life where I wouldn't did everything I could to try and fight the influence of my comic book work in my painting, mm -hmm. because I really saw them as two separate things. And now when I'm doing a painting and someone says, wow, that reminds me of a comic book, I'm actually feel quite good. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of coloring or in subject matter, it's something I, I do not shy away from if I have something that looks 19th century old master and then something that feels like 20th or 21st century comic book. You know, John, it's interesting when, when, when we were kids, I don't know, I, I think I might be older than you, but I, when we were kids, it was um, a lot of people, my, like uh, uh, Steve, uh, Steve Assel, a lot of um, friends would, would draw from comics. Uh, we're interested in, in well. it would, they would learn their anatomy from comics, you know? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, right. Yeah, and, me too. And me too. I, yeah, you did. Now, I did. I was more into, I, back then, I was more into abstract art more than I was. I was interested in comic books and a narrative. At that point, I guess Marvel was, Mar when did Marvel start? When did it develop? It developed in the late 60s, didn't it? Or uh, Early, early, I think, 
early seventies. Either early sixties or late fifties. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. It's been around it was, a while. It was. But at, it was like either you were a Marvel mm -hmm. fan or you were a, a, a DC fan, right? I mean, it was right. The best. right. Right, it was a Beatles, it was a Beatles, uh, Rolling Stones type of thing. Uh, yeah, Yankee Med <laughs> thing. But you know, a friend of mine from high school, a couple friends worked for um, who's a major guy from Marvel who had his uh, shop, who did a lot of advertising. I forget his oh, name. Oh, w w Wally Wood. Not Wally Wood. Tell me another name. We got you know. Uh, oh, uh, not Romita. No. Uh, not John Romita. There's no. an. Uh, um, he had a lot, he had an, you know, they did a lot of commercial work. Anyway, the person as a friend of mine is Joe Rubenstein. Ru <laughs> yeah, Joe, Joe, Joe yeah. Ru yeah I, well, I haven't seen him in years, but I remember when I worked there, he used yeah. to always bring in his paintings from the Art Students League. Right. Yeah. He, this was back in the 80s. He was yeah. studying at the league and he'd bring in his <laughs> portraits and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't yeah. remember he, if he was studying with Frank Mason or with, uh, I don't know. He he actually monitored for years for uh, Burton Silverman for Burton. Oh, Silverman. Yeah. okay. I yeah, all right. That's, a, that's another common tie uh, we all have is the well. Uh, I don't know about Matt, but from the league. But but back to the show. The the um, I think that's a common influence on a, on about half of the work. The cartoony as, aspect and the comic book aspect. Mm -hmm. and Zoila is really into comics. Me and me and Isaac grew up reading comics. And, and and that influences our work a lot. Um, I wanted, I think I'm going to try to get Isaac to put in his um, Bebop and uh, uh, what are the two Ninja Turtles? Anyway. Rocksteady. <laughs> yeah, Rocksteady and Bebop piece. But that, <laughs> that comic book quality was there when I was looking at it. And, uh, and yeah, and John, you, you have an interesting background because you have the balance of the comic book and the academic painting. But to even backtrack, a little further how i how we all know each other is um costa for the for the listeners who haven't who don't really know any of us costa and john are actually mentors and teachers of a lot of the other artists on here except matt um uh me and isaac met met john in 2006 at the academy and antonia as well mm -hmm. and bonnie as well who's not with us anymore uh and then me and Isaac went on after the academy, after we got our master's degree to keep studying with, with uh, we kind of transferred over to the league and we both studied at the league for another 10 years, at least me, 12 years with Costa. And uh, Zoila is also from the league and she's uh, studied, which you didn't put in your biography at all. You didn't mention any of no. your academic training. I know, so biography. mysterious, sorry. Um, I didn't think about it, I was, I was so nervous. I was like, oh, and I draw. She, had never, she was nervous about writing her biography, but, you <laughs> but uh, talking in first person is enough to mess with anyone's ego, I think. Talking about mm -hmm. yourself in, in uh, third person is bizarre. Uh, but Zoila, I, I really liked your work in The Watercolorist. It's, it's kind of a looser, whimsical kind of style than Bonnie's watercolors and, and, uh, mm -hmm. and Matt's has a tighter type of realist uh, approach to it and the different approaches to watercolor. There was a lot of watercolor work that I, I have. I'm still putting a few pieces of mine mm. too that I'm doing and I'm, I'm learning how to paint on a uh, four ply Bristol, which is really interesting, which I picked mm. up off of Burton Silverman Costa reading his book. Right. And that's an amazing, like you can, you can rub it back up. It's, it's so forgiving compared to like the watercolor <laughs> paper where it sucks in, it sucks mm -hmm. all your color into it and then it's stuck there. But uh, it's really, I'm really enjoying it. Um, also, Levine, you know, Levine and uh, uh, Schwartz, they, the, that trio, uh, and they've always debated among each other who kind of developed it first, you know? <laughs> that, you're talking about David Levine? Yeah, yeah. They did the both. They worked on that plate, uh, uh, watercolor paper, where it really cool. uh, pulled out, as, as, uh, as Chris has been saying. And, and you know, I mean, you guys might know more than me. There is a Scottish 19th, uh, 19th 20th century uh, watercolorist who had, who painted on a, what he would do is he would lay down a ground of white gouache hmm. and then he would paint on the white gouache. So it had that pool effect, like that That's milky cloudy pool effect. And I can't remember his name. Do, do you guys know who I'm talking about or? I, I don't. Yeah. I think that's a pretty and, common technique, though. I've heard of that before. Like, and then Erwin Greenberg, Erwin uh, Greenberg kind of took it on, too, the watercolorist that uh, 
uh, yeah, anyway, I just wanted to add that, yeah. Uh, for that technique with a gum trag tragacan, you know that? You put the gum tragacan on and then it lifts really easily. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah I'm, we... I'm, paint I'm painting actually as I talk to you guys. So it's my Do you uh, move the camera over so we can look at you paint? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Wait, let's see. No, I'm the actually, wrong way. I'm actually putting a photo of that painting up because we're doing a photograph. Nice. Uh, yeah. Wait, to... I'll do it the other way. Hold on, I'll show you. Um, I'm we're just going to flip a... the. I'm going to flip the camera around. Uh, here you can see. There's my underpainting. Nice. And um, I'm doing. So I don't usually paint like this. I. Uh, I, but I, I got very recently, be, I think it's a COVID thing. I got, I, I've been out with, you can see the trees out here mm -hmm. and there. And so I was like, oh, I'll start painting the trees. And then I, I started thinking about Maxfield Parish mm -hmm. and yeah. how truly bizarre those late landscapes are. I mean, they're just weird. Mm -hmm. uh, they're nothing like naturalistic landscapes. They're no, just they're these not. strange things. And there's that one painting where he had finished it and uh, I think it was for reproduction. And then after it was finished, he decided to paint out the figure and then he, and, and so it shows the blue tree huh. and that blue tree uh, showed his technique. And then I guess he also read about, wrote about his technique. And, mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so you can sort of see what I'm, and I'm that's just- That's what I, sure. when I saw it, that's what it looked like to me. Exactly. Cause he would paint on opaque, the opaque, uh, st uh, structures were uh, cerulean blue, and right. any any sky it's skies and reflective uh, structures were the white uh, white ground. And he was a hundred percent glazer, a hundred percent glazer. So mm -hmm. I decided I was like, okay, it's COVID time. I'm out here. I set up I set up a studio out here that's in the corner. It's the corner of a room you'd send a bad kid to. <laughs> uh, so I don't have a. I'm not working in a studio as much in the corner of a living room. But I have actually worked in this corner of the living room uh, back in 1988 and 89. So it's wow. familiar, but it's certainly not a studio, which, but you know, the thing about being an artist is you can, you can work anywhere. And, you know, whenever I have a student that says, oh, I can't work, I don't have a studio. Mm -hmm. I always, I'm like, of course you can, you know, you just set up something and, life. you know, a table easel, anything, and you start working, you know, it's the right. only thing that, you know, like Costa was talking about, like painting in the, out of this hotel room in Greece. It's certainly not his studio, right? It's a hotel room, but he's looking out and he's like, okay, I'm gonna start working. Mm. So that's, and, and right now my mall stick is uh, an arrow shaft that I had Robin Hood in, so. <laughs> I love it, I love it. it it's now uh, my mall stick. Um, yeah, so the Maxfield Parish technique was so bizarre to me and his landscapes are just strange. I mean, they're, the more you look at them, the weirder they get. And, you know, first they seem like really nice, kind of like a little cabin and nice trees. And then the more you look at them, like, these are just weird things and weird colors that make no sense and it's a little bit psychedelic. And, and they're half the size of your, um, your piece there. They would like, all, because I did see them live and they're all, they're, all of those are within, you know, 24 inches. They're all kind of really sm nice, small sizes, no? I mean, from one- Yeah, I've, I've only seen a couple, but they were tiny. Tiny, oh, are yeah. you talking about um, Parrish? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, I should have told you, John. Last, last. Um, I don't know. It was like three or four months ago. We had maybe four of them at Sotheby's. Oh my! Oh, really? God, really? Yeah, I didn't know that they were that rare oh. to see. Oh, All right. oh my so God! Remember, so, yeah. guys, remember my intro to Matt Myers, <laughs> but that, but Matt, as a rule, usually will let me know, like John, you got to come to the, you got to yeah. come to Sotheby's. This is, and then you go and you get to see like these amazing. Works. Yeah, you have to let us all know, Matt. And you, yeah, right, yeah. you right can put now, your nose up to the pieces. You right know? right like now, so um, you guys should be aware that uh, in January, they're going to have an old master sale, and they got a Botticelli that has been at the Met for years and years, and I guess oh, either the Met is going to sell it or the, the family that actually owns it and has been consigning it forever. It's a portrait of a gentleman. It's probably going to go for like $80 million, and you can see it in a room if you just go there and say you want to see it. So Matt, give give everybody on the uh, email chain a heads up. Um, yeah, sure. Ma Matt, I have a I have a uh, a crude question. What were the prices of the Maxfield parishes? Uh, I can't remember. You're not even a ballpark. I, I keep. I, mean, I don't think I don't think they were in the millions because it falls under American painting. 
Yeah, I feel like he's very underpriced right they now. They don't, yeah, they don't command the prices that like contemporary art and some of the big impressionists get. But yeah. uh, I, I, I'd say I in the million one. range, John. What? I'd say about in the million range. <clears throat> yeah, I, I I saw Maxfield Parrish uh, landscape in uh, the Grand Palais in Paris a couple of years ago mm -hmm. at an art show that was being sold for like three hundred fifty thousand or something. Mm. And I just. And I was thinking how I'm way underpriced that was when you think about right. any contemporary. Oh you know, yeah, I mean, if you if you look at American art and all the the amazing techniques that went into that, and then you look at you know contemporary art now, you're like, what happened? You know, what happened yeah. in the '70s or '80s that? What? How, that how changed, many? Right. How many Maxfield the whole Paris's? trajectory? You know. How many Maxfield like, parishes can you buy for one Damien Hirst spot painting? <clears throat> Probably a dozen. Yeah. <laughs> Postmodernism happened. Yeah. Uh, um, that's. I think that's one of the things about studying at the league is it was its strong history because a lot of illustrators and where did where did uh, Maxwell Parrish come? Sent where was he based in the states? Yeah. Do you know where he grew? Where he worked or? I, I did read all this on Wikipedia, but for me to answer correctly, I would have to go back to Wikipedia. Well, just so you all know, the next show will be a, probably a figure-based show, hmm. um, and I'm going to get another broad range of artists in. And uh, doing the, this show makes me makes me think about all the artists that I've known, New York City artists specifically. So we'll we'll try to put that piece in the next show. Uh, uh, John, what's that one titled? I'm gonna. I'm also gonna put it in a scrapbook, a photo of it, because I'm doing a. Um, this one, I, I I have a very clever title for it. It's called uh, Diana Hunting. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so I think Costa has the the award for the cleverest titles, which was oh. was so boring. I even had to change them and spice it up and call it Figure Number One and Number Two. <laughs> so Co Costa, your work that you submitted. Are, are just um, figure drawings. Do you want to talk no. at all about the model you use? Because I assume it's the same model for all those drawings. Not, not the same, but I've used it. It was actually a, a, an old girlfriend of mine posed for a bunch of them. Uh, and it was actually a, a, a several of them. Uh, actually, I think maybe even all of them, now like, except for two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th they were done in um, a friend's um, uh, drawing group. Uh, this woman, Kathy Ruttenberg, I don't know if you know, she's an artist. She does a lot of these, um, she does these ceramic sculptures. She's very popular these days. She has um, uh, these ceramic sculptures that are on uh, Broadway in different streets, you know, mm -hmm. and they're, I know, anyways, right. you, you know, you've heard, you've seen them, right, uh, guys? Yes. No? Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're uh, playful, right? Animal and very playful things, mm -hmm. right? That was, anyway, she had a drawing group and she would like kind of a little bit, and she had, you know, Victorian furniture, and she, she would like, and then I, like I said, my girlfriend at the time, I was getting her work for modeling gigs, so she posed for her, and Kathy would like to pose the models with a little bit of, um, you know, maybe a, a lingerie, like maybe a, a, a socks, I think one might, one of the drawings might have like socks and shoes, all and the anytime, things you wouldn't let me do in your studio. I know, I know, I know. You see that I need to no. But the thing is that once you put an apparel on a nude figure, like actually in a way, what what uh, what John is doing in his painting, he's talking about Botticelli, and we know it comes from the uh, classical Greeks, the 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 see-through garments that right. <laughs> let's call them the, <laughs> that the, and let's wet them. <laughs> let's wet them. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing sexier. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yeah. and then a, a transparent, uh, a gauze, uh, a wet, clingy <laughs> uh, yeah. fabric on <laughs> on on the body, you know, and and so I think anyway. So the so the, that's so. I yes, I was forced to draw that because uh, my work tends to be uh, the opposite. It tends to be not um, eroticized. It, it it actually kind of it's the erotic nature is de-emphasized you know a little bit well definitely in my work so well, anyway when you when you, that, when you draw and paint nudes though you're kind of forced to confront a little bit of eroticism in there oh and, and also 
and also if you're doing uh, like a lot of my models over the years were been people that I've had relationships, sexual relationships with. So, uh, and, and I, I would say, honestly, in the beginning, there's a lot of erotic drawings. <laughs> I just like relationships. In the beginning, they're highly erotic. And then as time goes on, they get less so. It's funny. Oh my God, right? Well, it's, really you, know, like you know what's funny? You know what's our strange? marriage life. Not again. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, you know, I, it's funny because I always, I always joke that I think that there's two types of artists. There's the artist that has that, the this the like has like their model, their erotic models are the people they've had relationships with, mm -hmm. and then there's the other type who never have relationships with their erotic models, which which is me, because I always. <laughs> but then my work is always kind of has that erotic feel because it's never, um, it's never realized. Mm -hmm. And then like if I'm dating somebody, like when I started dating my wife and, and I'd asked her first, you know, to model for me. And then we actually, she never modeled for me. We ended up starting to date. And then six months in, she said, will you paint me? And I only painted her face with little angel wings. And then I painted, a, and then when I did a big paint, a, a major painting of her, I painted her in full armor. <laughs> <laughs> and was, it's, it's, sort of, it's interesting. I, I, like, I, hear, I wouldn't paint her at all, like in a, in a nude way. We're no, still waiting you know, for that, John. <laughs> yeah. No, I want to say to that, that is true. And you know what, my work, a lot of the work over the years, because I've basically worked with the same models doing these motifs, these, you know, uh, uh, the Joya, Miranda, Connie. And, right. And, and with Miranda and Joya, uh, they're, you know, very attractive young women. And in sometimes the poses are a little charged, but they're like, like uh, Chris said, you can't avoid it. And, uh, but in, in what you're saying, John, I think it's very true that the, the, the tension, the sexual tension increases when you're not involved with them, you know, and so that you could actually put it to, you know, to, to, um, to uh, um, uh, plant it in your painting, you know? So right. I always it, tell this it, story. It, yeah, go ahead, yeah. sorry. Go on, no, you tell the story that. So, so I had one of my collectors uh, uh, call me one, one night, he and his wife were, were uh, tying one on, they were drinking, definitely were, because then they have several of my Miranda uh, pieces and one, so they called me up out of the blue, they were, they were drunk they, and asked me, if if Miranda and I had an affair, <laughs> we were, <laughs> they wanted the inside skinny they on were, the artwork. They were they were looking at the drawing, I guess, and it was like kind of intimate, you know. I you know, and and of course, anytime anytime a person looks back to the viewer, right? The whole agency change and stuff. It's very charged, regardless, yeah. you know. And uh, but uh, but anyway, that's yeah, it's a good that's point. Funny. John. Yeah, well, that's I really like the spun spontaneity of the quicker sketches that you gave me and yeah. uh that 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 kind of harkens back to the original point when i started this uh this gallery website store was to it, me and isaac were discussing how we had so much artwork as a figurative artist with models mm -hmm. and, and it was like a backlog of all this work like and i've been to your place costa you have piles and piles of drawings mm -hmm. and they just back up and that that was the original concept of the store was just a place to put our, our overflow and to sell some of our studio work that I know Ginsburg has his studio sales. He probably experiences the same thing. Right. Um, hmm. But then eventually it just transformed into just having a gallery. And, and now I'm just kind of resigned to the fact that we're going to put people's finished what they're doing now in there as well. But um, hmm. I, I appreciate the spontaneity of those, those drawings yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of, they kind of stand alone as in, they're not cartoony in an illustrative sense, yeah. but, I, but I was thinking more of the sense of cartoon as in like the Italian word cartoon, like a design yeah, yeah. You know, mm. kind of thing. Oh, that's, the, that's interesting. For, for the concept. Can, of I, can I ask a, a, a sort of a, a question about, did Costa, do you went to SVA? <laughs> uh, no, I, not I, SVA, I, I mean, I'm sorry, High School of Art and Design. Yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So were you, were you were you with Stephen and with Ava Harold? Ava, Ava, you know Ava, you know. Yeah. Very, very. She's a best friend. Oh, yeah. good. Yeah, I love I mean, Ava. I have, you know, we, you know, it's funny because I ran into somebody, um, a, an old friend, uh, recent, well, uh, last year, and 
I keep meaning to get in touch with Ava because we were supposed to do some drawing switch, um, but um, I'm trying to think of what it was. Anyway, an aside. So, so Steve, this is years ago. Steve and I and his, uh, another friend, we we um, Steve and a sale. Yeah, yeah, and we were um, we did a late night one of you know when Steve was doing his like uh, goth his goth period thing. I would go with him. Oh, I remember we'd go that. To these, we'd go to these uh, late night you know S uh, and uh, M joints, right? Uh, right and so, with, the, with, with the people with the gas masks yeah, and the feathers and all the weird things. And, and with yeah. Stevie Nicks background music always. That's when I realized that Stevie Nicks was a, is a goth queen, you know, because they make Stevie Nicks songs. <laughs> but uh, so we we end up in this. Uh, in this place that Ava's, uh, I guess her her uh, her husband or her her man Manny Manny. Manny I don't know. Her husband, husband her husband at the time he was still yeah, alive. Yeah, yeah. So you know Manny, and so you know John. The uh, the what's that place we're talking about? That uh, comedy cellar Char and the olive tree. The olive tree. Yeah. And yeah. so we went into the olive tree for you know because that was a twenty four hour joint with the Ch Charlie Chaplin, and we're right. sitting in a booth. You know, here we are in the booth. It was Steve and I, and 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 um, and I think it was Lino, Steve's friend. Okay, and so Steve, you so we're sitting, chatting, whatever, blah blah. And Steve looks over, and by me, adjacent to me, was a drawing on a wall, and he looked at it. Goes, boy, that looks like you. <laughs> and I look over, and it's a drawing of me. Because Ava and I, we, we moved back in the 70s. I always tell this story, uh, Chris, that when, you know, back in the 70s, we were, you know, New York was, you know, so cheap, you know, and, and, and my then my girlfriend and I moved to Hoboken back in 70, 77, 78, right? And then that started a lot of people moving to Hoboken. So we were a community of artists in Hoboken back day. And Ava was with us. And so Ava and I, and all of us uh, drew and painted each other for years. Anyway, that's the, yeah, yeah. And yes, we were in, uh, and you know, the other thing with Ava, John, if people don't know, Ava's mother was a model. Was a model. Yeah, so you know this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you know Ava's mom? No, no, no. I, I didn't either. So guys, just so you know, this will be another artist that Chris will hopefully show is Ava Harrell. And she went to, there were two big art high schools in New York City. There still mm. are, but that, well, mm. it was a high school of art and design and the high school of music and art. Music and art eventually at some point merged with uh, the high school of performing arts, which the movie Fame was based on right. to become LaGuardia. But at the time there were two. And uh, music and art was up on the on the hill in Harlem, and art and high school of art and design is still there on Fifty Sixth and Lex yeah. or Third. Yeah. So, yeah. And um, and so what we we're talking about, Abba Harl, who went there, Stephen Sale went there, Costa went there, um, Mark, um, a oh, great comic book artist who yeah. was went to school with you guys. Didn't Max uh, Ginsburg teach there as well? Yeah, Max, Max and and Irwin. But wait, who is uh, uh, another comic book artist? Uh, uh, Oh my God, he he did a great job. And, and Mark, uh, his first Mark name. Mark, not Mark on top. Mark uh, t uh, with a T, right? Which uh, yeah, Texiera. Tex, Texiera. Mark yeah. Texiera, a great comic book artist. They yeah. all went there. So you have this magic time, in which I wasn't there at that. High. I went to. I grew up in the city also, but I wasn't yeah. at this at this high school. But you have this magic moment with these. New York City artists that needed a steady job and ended up in this high school teaching yes. a bunch of punk kids that were coming in in the 70s and 60s and 70s. And so these kids are going to art and design are having this extraordinary art education. I mean, yes. extraordinary. And an art education that if they'd gone off to RISD or gone to Pratt, they, they, were, getting, they were getting a level of, Costa, am I right? This is what I've got. Oh, definitely. That, Absolutely. And, no, no, and, no, no. uh, and so it's, it's quite, so when we're talking about Ava, she was part of that group. And if you, ever, if you ever go to the Comedy Cellar and the Olive Tree, when it, when it opens af again after uh, COVID. So it was, it, it never closed. Uh, I thought that she, she sold it, no? Or she? Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's yeah. in the family. It's, it, her her, her uh, stepson is running it, Gnome. Oh, okay. okay. So it's in the family and she still lives above it. But yeah. the way I met 
Ava, she started studying with me at the New York Academy of Art at some point in the early 2000s. And she told me, she came into class one day to say, I'm not going to be in class. And I, I just wanted you to know that I really love you as a teacher. It has nothing to do with that. And I go, and she goes, I have a work emergency. I said, what do you do? And she goes, well, I, I have a restaurant. I go, what is it? Olive tree. I go, you know that place. I go there all the time. I said, there's some drawings on the wall. I, I guess it must be like an old Italian. I, for some reason, I saw these drawings. I went, oh, I know that this is an old Italian man that did these drawings, probably studied oh, at the sure. league in the 1920s or 30s, <laughs> worked in the WPA. One of those people that never became well known, but knew how to, learn how to draw and was in the village just drawing people sitting at cafes. And I tell Ava this and Ava looks, she turns red and she puts her eyes down and goes, those are my drawings. And then I looked at her and I go, and I went, so why are you studying with me? <laughs> no, she was very, Ava was probably, I would say, on a, a very, I mean, super high talent. And then she had, yeah. you know, she kind of took a, a lot. She was responsible for her mom, too, as you know, right? Yeah. There was a big strain in her life. So she kind of didn't commit as much as she early on into her art. But as far as her abilities and her, her soul, artistic, very high on that meter, don't you think? No, yeah. amazing. Yeah, amazing. And I, I do talk, I talk to her about once a, once a week. I'll, or once I'll every have to two reach weeks. out for her and put her in a show. Yeah, I'll, I'll put you in touch. So I know this, this, this show isn't about, this podcast isn't about Ava, but she'll be happy, she'll be oh. happy and embarrassed to have been mentioned. There'll be some Hey, hey one thing, guys. One thing, Chris, uh, you, since we're, we're, you know, we're broadcasting and you asked a question and I looked it up, the main teacher apparently of Maxwell Parrish was, uh, was uh, Thomas Anschultz and, and, and he studied at the Philadelphia Museum of Art mm. with Anschultz. Oh. And you know, the Anschultz, that, that painting the Met has, that beautiful painting, the woman with that red dress, you guys know it, right? And she's leaning, she has a Express in her face. It's like, no, she's in uh, three chord seven eighths. You know what that painting? She's like, not, this. it's a, not, you know it, you know it. It's just not, uh, I'll look it, I'll look it up though, or maybe you'll text yeah, you'll it out see. to all you'll of know. us. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I will. Yeah. yeah. Matt, when you uh, came to study at Pratt, is that when you moved to New York City? Yeah. Yeah, I got, I, I went from a, a Quaker college in uh, North Carolina called Guilford College, and it had some, had a really amazing uh, art teacher called Roy Nydorf, who was from Long Island, and he went to, uh, what was this, he went to Yale, he kind of got into, into Yale through the back door, he said, because they're so selective in how many people they allow, and his portfolio, I guess, at the time was not stellar, so he somehow got into it through some programs and then got accepted eventually, but mm. a phenomenal uh, artist. And he just ended up at Guilford for a job and he was there for maybe 12 years or so before I came along. And then we just hit it off. Like we were not like a teacher and student. We were like buddies almost. And he taught me a lot of the basic in arts because before that I was only doing kind of commercial art. Like I could draw really well, but I never had a, a mentor. So he showed me printmaking, um, drawing. He, he taught everything there, painting, everything. I did sculpture. I was doing everything at Guilford, at different places around Guilford. But uh, then uh, I think I put in, for graduate school, I put in Yale. I put in all these high, high caliber colleges because my ego was like really up there because I guess in... In North Carolina, there just wasn't, didn't seem to be a lot of competition. So I thought I was like, I'm, I'm one of the top artists. I'll get into one of these colleges. And I got rejected out of all the colleges. So <laughs> I ended up, me and my wife, um, Laura, we just, it, it, we met this professor who had done a, uh, a program of printmaking in uh, Val di Tavo, Italy. And he knew some Italian families. And he said, well, let me talk to a family and see if because I, I, I was interested at that time to go to Italy and to study since I had a year to wait till I could get into another college. So it ended up that we went to teach English uh, at a family's house in outside of Lucca, Italy. So wow. I, was, I was able to just go, like my wife would stay and like tutor like one of their kids. Like nobody else was really interested. She would just like be hanging around the house if they wanted to speak some conversational English, that was fine. If not, fine. 
it was like no pressure at all. So I, I just ended up going all over Italy and, um, you know, looking at a lot of art, you know, was, I, we were only an hour from Florence. So I went there like once a week. And then uh, to get back to your Pratt question, I was there for six months. So towards the end of it, I had to apply for another college and uh, the same professor um, that got me into it, the Italian thing told me, why don't you try Pratt? Because he taught there. Uh, his name was David Finkbeiner, really awesome artist and printmaker. And uh, so I applied for it and got in like right away. And then, you know, I had to pull up all my stuff when I got back and go find a place in like Brooklyn, close by. I didn't really know the area. You know, I'd only been to New York City a few times. And this was in 93. So I was starting like end of 93. So I was starting in the uh, beginning of 90. Uh, it was late 93, but the classes were going like from winter to, to spring, nine, 93, 94. And, uh, you know, Pratt was still at that time pretty depressed. I think it had gone through a lot of financial changes. Like at one time I, I knew that there was a lot of printmakers, you know, New York printmaker or uh, artists that were doing prints of their stuff at Pratt and Pratt Manhattan. But uh, I think those glory days were kind of over and they were just riding on their their laurels and their uh, their reputation. But there were still some pretty amazing teachers at Pratt at that time. And they were they were kind of in a renaissance in a way. There was a the provost was um, Thomas Schutte and he he had a vision to bring Pratt back and there was like a lot of renovation, a lot of uh, public art. Like if you go to Pratt now, you'll see a lot of sculptures, totally different than when I went there. They they brick the roads to make it uh, really look old, old kind of old fashioned in a way. Um, so you came to New York just to study as well, kind of like the same as me and yeah, Isaac and Antonia and I think Bonnie as well lived upstate. Uh, just kind of drawn into New York to learn how to you know, to keep studying. At least that's that's how I got here. Zoila, you're you're a native? Yeah, I'm um, right here. Oh. Okay. Yeah. I, I was actually from natives. upstate New York originally in Niagara Falls. Okay. Yeah, I saw that on the and then you went to Carolina and then to Italy. I got a yeah. chance to yeah, travel well, through Italy. Virginia, so. North Carolina, Italy, where, where back in to Virginia. New York. Where in Virginia? Ron Roanoke, Virginia. Oh, okay. So yeah, that's where that's where my wife Laura's from. I have friends down there. It's a good area. Chris is Virginian. Yeah, I grew yeah, up I saw that in his bio. I didn't know till I read it, Chris. Yeah, I've been. And and, and some of my family came to Virginia, but like in the before the United States was formed. Wow. They they, they were in the they came to Virginia in the sixteen they immigrated in the sixteen hundreds to Virginia. Yeah, when I first saw your name, John, I thought uh, is this like a royal family of. Brits that just kind of settled in, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> settled in the United States. I think the Wellingtons were, they were German and they, uh, <laughs> it was, they, I mean, I do have Scottish and Irish and English blood, mm -hmm. like Bur I had Burnses and a whole bunch of Sherwoods and, but the Wellingtons were actually G Lutheran German. Wow. And uh, Duke, the Duke of Wellington had just beaten Napoleon and there was like a family <laughs> of German Prussian soldiers and so they changed the name to Wellington because they were like, because it was kind of like a military hero. Wow. So what was your name before that? Um, I think, well, there were a bunch of them, but I mean, in the German side, there were Schmitz and a whole bunch. Mm. Wow. Um, and, and then there's a whole French side that came to New Orleans, I think as early as 1612. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a real mutt. <laughs> true, like true, a true like mutt. my family. Yeah, it's your mind. I, I have to, I, I would love, Zoila, so you grew up, where did you grow up in the city? Um, I grew up in um, Manhattan, so like I was five, and then I moved to Queens, and then I've been living back in Manhattan since I was 18. Oh, wow. So, but pretty much Harlem. Okay. And then, yeah, Harlem, and then Corona. So, and so then you're a I true New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. You I didn't John, go to Art and Design, though. You and John are kind of true New Yorkers. Yeah, I, so, I kind of wish I had gone to art and design. Like, where did so you go for, high, where was your high school? LaGuardia. The, oh, the, well, that's the like going, school. but LaGuardia was, is music and art and high school of performing arts combined. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just a pretty artsy school. It's pretty artsy. It's very artsy. It's a hard so, school to get into, also. Um, or it seems to. I, <laughs> I think it was, but I don't know what it's like now. I feel like it, it's really changed or something. Yeah. Um, I heard that it's they're focusing on academia or, but it was it was interesting. I was I was really bad. I would like I mean, I would cut class to go paint. And my teachers will let me just go paint in the hallways. It's like, it's okay. You don't have to go to history class. You can just paint. I'm like, all right, cool. Thank you. It's so you like, used to paint in the hallways of LaGuardia? Yeah, it was, it was really nice. It was, um, memories. Yeah, were you, were you there when, when you, were you there when Madonna's uh, kid was there or? No, no, that was like, I think that was after I already graduated. I, I've noticed it's like kind of a public school that a lot of, well-known people have are happy to have their kids go to yeah i think it's just for like the the name you know yeah. like i mean a lot of like i i've had a lot of talented um classmates like ridiculously talented classmates and a lot of them didn't want to keep pursuing art they just wanted to go do their like own thing or their yeah. parents forced them to go to like business school um mm. which makes sense because it's it's kind of scary you know yeah definitely mm -hmm. but yeah so i'm i'm from here and um, I also I, we we have a friend, Natalie, who teaches English at LaGuardia. Okay. How long have you been working at the League? The Art Students League? Zoila? Oh, me? I started in November. Really? Yeah. Oh, I started working. For, oh, I mean, working is in like in the studios there. Oh, like, oh, oh, like for, for like, not, not the I want to say three <laughs> years, but with this quarantine, it, it like three and a half or nice. three chunk of time yeah. if i was to redo it again i'd probably uh i don't know i'd probably just spend cut i mean i would never have met john but i don't know it's a lot the league was a lot is a lot a good place to go for good education very affordable mm. atelier type education i just don't think the piece of paper really matters as much but did you get a master's degree matt yeah i did yeah i got it at pratt yeah and then we yeah, have i'm working i'm working on my phd of painting yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> you look so i can paint and also you know operate on your femur you want yeah. you want the phd of archery yeah the phd that i would really be interested in so <laughs> zola so what did, what did you do after uh, after uh, laguardia i didn't go to school for a little bit oh actually i went to sva and then i realized like i don't need the piece of paper and it's right. really expensive, so like mm. I left. And then I, I pursued like um classics degree eventually. Mm. And oh really? I, yeah. Yeah. Where, I, where I did you go for that? Um the CUNY BA program. It's the CUNY Baccalaureate. It's oh, long. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And more and more affordable. Yeah, it's very it's very affordable. And the teachers, um, they're really great because like it's a very the classics community in New York is a very small community. So they mm -hmm. tend to teach at the same schools, like all through the city, like, um, well, different schools, but they're the same teachers. It's the same classics program. So oh, that's they all really know each other. Everyone knows yeah. each other. Mm -hmm. So um, has, has that influenced your art? I mean, the, that background, does it come in thematically and into your subjects or? I think so. Like, I think um, I studied the classics, but I kind of went very into medieval, medieval studies. I've, I really had an interest in that after the classics and so many concepts like I'm like oh I'm influenced by that I, I, I can't help it I couldn't divorce myself from that right you know um what, what is caustics exactly it's a burn moving removing burning away or caustics what, what you said caustics no classics oh, classics oh okay oh yeah yeah I totally went on this tangent. Okay. Oh, no, no sorry. Classics. No, 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 non art. No. Non. So that that has brought that has influenced. I think it, it it must have. Like, I realize I'm working on a graphic novel right now, and I was going to ask you about that. It's so medieval. It's like, oh, okay. Did, and did you just, show me? Did you show me that when we we yeah, did? Yeah. Right? It's all coming back to me. I remember being so blown away by what you were doing, and. Uh, your your that you know your your group at Marshalls was so uh, hyper talented. I felt. I mean, there were so many people doing 
really extraordinary things that you and there was um, uh, the Philippine gentleman that was just off the charts. Andrew. Andrew, and I just like, I remember looking at all of your work and going, oh my God, this is insane. Thank you know, you that was good. happening. Is there, is there a, de a timeline on the comic book coming out? You know, Isaac's working on a comic book too. I didn't and know he, that. He won't let anyone look at it. Like <laughs> I understand project. that. He wants to break it all out at once. Mm -hmm. I wish he could have been on here because, you know, we're missing mm -hmm. Isaac. And um, you all were talking about printmaking. We also had uh, Antonia. I put up a, P a print of hers because she used to work in the printmaking department in the New York Academy. And she's very kind of diverse. She does all kinds of stuff, sculpture, drawing, painting, printmaking. But, but it's actual print of Kristoff I put in there in memory oh. of Kristoff recently oh yeah one of our endeared models yeah and, but, did, um, christoph must have modeled at the league right oh yeah he oh, was yeah. there he was there to the end he's he was all about modeling he's one of those models we talked about this before like you have models then you have like models like raven that are just going to be modeling their whole lives and totally devoted to the trade of modeling and the and like it's mm. in there it's like organically part of them and that was Kristoff so hmm. I had to dedicate the show to, to his memory uh this one maybe uh -oh. you might want to do a Kristoff show actually yeah we could do that I sold my only Kristoff I had it was before he I would have kept it but if I, yeah. I, could, I could repaint it I still have the photos but I shouldn't mention that because the client might get angry but uh I had done a, he modeled in Costa's class he modeled it was in drag as a French maid. And uh, mm. the print we have in the show is him in a tutu. <laughs> he loves so that singer. piece, Chris, that piece you did was sold? Yeah. You're, you're, yeah. That was a very strong piece. Yeah. I read it now, but it's nice to eat too. So you said the deadline for the comic book is in the, just the, the future. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's very vague. It'll, it'll happen. I'm working on the second it? chapter. Are you going to do are, are you, do you, how will you get it published? I have no idea. I have no idea. It's like, I just started and I was like, um, just to do one or two pages. And then it just kept going and going. And it's like, and then the story became a little more developed and it's, it's solid enough that, you know, there's an actual storyline. I, I have a, I have a weird, I, I, I'm a big believer in active inspiration. <laughs> <laughs> which is I'm painting right now and I don't have reference for example and I'm you know other than outside I'm sort of making things up as I go along and so my active inspiration for you is that I think um, rather than waiting for the complete book you should start posting a first page and start creating a a serialized idea of it where people start awaiting things coming and yeah. and get uh, get interest not at the finished product but get interest in in as it's going and you could even be posting sometimes studies like works in progress sewing showing like uh you know showing a little bit of the the how the sausage gets made mm. and Some it's teasers. just a thought it's it's the opposite of like you know doing your how many 22 or 48 pages or whatever and doing the finished book and finding a publisher and you know, doing like when I worked in comics, it's like now it's like it'd be, you know, you could sort of there's venues to actually give people a teaser and let people have that serialized feel. Yeah, I think I should. Thank you. I am um, like the next George I Martin. This, like, oh, I, don't, I, don't know, I have this sort of like um, the shyness about my art. It's like a lot of the stuff that I actually do. I don't I don't post. I post like sketches and it's just like, oh, I don't know why. But I, I think know you're why. right. I think I should. The, the shyness is, uh, is very normal. And the shyness is because uh, it's like, I realized before I remember doing it about to do a show or about to do anything, I was angry. And that anger is not like, cause I'm angry at anyone or anything. I'm angry at my ideas that I'm gonna get judged. Hmm. It's like a defensive anger. So shyness or anger, however one does it, it's about whenever we're putting anything out, we're gonna expect reactions and not every reaction is gonna be uh, a pat on how lovely and wonderful we are. It's uh, sometimes reactions are going to be negative and, or, and even if they're not, it, it's just that it's this very scary thing to put your work out and, and to have reactions. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel bad about being shy or being anything, 
But I, I think that it's important for us artists that do want to have audiences that to acknowledge those moments when we're either shy or we feel like, like I, I be, I'm going to be angry at them before they're angry at me, whatever, whatever way we decide to handle it, mm -hmm. uh, to, to acknowledge it and then get past it and get our work out there and realize that people's reactions, either super positive, indifferent or super negative that they don't ultimately, they, they can have power over the moment, but they can't have power over our lives as artists that in the end, we're going to make the art we make. And this is why we do it, you know, and, um, mm -hmm. and so I, I, you know, I just have that conversation with yourself and, and then start showing your art. And John, and, just to add, there's a third, it's indifference. Yeah, I, I did mention that. Indifference <laughs> is Isaac the worst. Lepto, <laughs> I, always say, I always say that someone that comes into There's my, nothing more painful than indifference. It, there, <laughs> so Chris, Chris and Matt have both been to my, my home slash studio, and my paintings are like double and triple hung around the walls, you know, yeah. like an old salon. And sometimes people will come into my studio and they'll talk and they'll have a you know, glass of wine or everything. And they'll never look or make a comment on any of the art. Mm. And I'm always like, how's, how's that possible? You know, like, <laughs> like, but that, yeah, the indifference is really, uh, that's, that's biting. Let me, uh, one thing, Chris, I'm just going to say, I'm going to have to jump off, but let me just, I'm going to throw in something that I was, I, I just, something interesting I never thought of. The other day I was talking to a colleague. Now we're all, I mean, I tell, we're all like, let's say, well, not Zola. She's a young woman I think and but but I in the 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 person I was talking to, to was in his 60s okay and he was telling me how he's been since the pandemic he's been making producing these large paintings and you know let's face it I don't know how you guys I mean the the selling market is pretty on a low end and it was even before the pandemic Right. Absolutely. And, right. and so, you know, and, and now, of course, he's got the space, but then what are you going to do with work? It just piles on. And, and, and um, on a, just an aside to that, he also mentioned something that I thought would be an interesting uh, venture for somebody who has money to actually uh, rent or buy a big space, factory space, and have it be a, an estate storage place and a state slash exhibition space wouldn't that be amazing for for people to put there you know because it's a, one of a, a, a mutual friend died and his widow now has to deal with his estate you know but that's an aside so he told me about his large paintings he's doing and he said you know it's interesting he thinks that the reason he's doing them is because he feels his facilities are waning a little bit Mm. And he has a hard time seeing small, uh, uh, holding his, I know, with the mile stick or no mile stick, making smaller marks. Is that right. interesting? So he's doing larger paintings in order to have him uh, uh, look well because of his, what he feels is his lack of uh, his waning facilities. I that, that makes so much sense to me. I know. So, I never thought of that. Right? Costa, I, I, I'm painting with new eyes. Oh, you, got, right. you got the laser stuff or the uh, no I, I i i so this summer i started in my archery i realized i couldn't see anymore and in my painting i couldn't see uh, and it turned out i had cataracts in both eyes and and that's why i couldn't i was losing my vision so september 1st and september 15th i had my left eye and my right eye I had astigmatism mm -hmm. and cataracts and new lenses so and i'll get how, my final you're seeing you're seeing you're like x-ray vision now huh um, I, so I have it set so that I see 2015 distance, yeah, like fighter yeah. pilot level, and right. I'm using like a click, uh, these okay. glasses that, you know, over the counter Amazon to paint with or to read. Right. right. Okay. But, Great. Uh, yeah, that's... But no, I, so I understand that, that feeling yeah. of, uh, but yeah. I, I didn't know that I had cataracts. I just thought I was losing my vision. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Well, so I, that was... I, I like that idea of a holding company. Uh, did yeah, Goya, right. Did Goya work bigger and bigger as he got older and older? As he's as he lost his eyesight? Because I, my eyesight started. Well, his la his black paintings, or they call the black paintings. Well, they were uh, they were pretty much uh, they were murals on walls, and yeah, they were right. pretty large. Seems like I would say, but, bigger, but bigger. I don't know. Did he do that late in his life, or? Was oh yeah, a big yeah. Commission? That was in his With, own house, right? Right, right. Nobody yeah. saw those. 
No, I mean they're yeah they're in now in the in the, in the Prado upstairs. They right. renovated. Yeah, they're yeah. in the, they're in that one room that it's called I think the Black Room or something. Yeah, it's the Black Room. Yeah. Wow. yeah. I, I I always so one of the things when I'm I'm teaching about uh, oil paint, uh, one of the first things I try and deconstruct is the use of black because at RISD, uh, you know, one of the big no-nos in oil painting was you never <laughs> use black. You mix. You mix your black with alizarin and crimson and phthalo green, wow. and you don't use black. Mm. And and now when I teach, I say, oh, well, I'm too. I'm glad that Goya and Velasquez and Rembrandt and Van Gogh <laughs> and you know uh, Rosa Bonheur and every other one of those artists never had my art teachers because they all use black. <laughs> and and so the thought then I say, well, they shouldn't. So then I say. You know, one of the things I'll always say, well, so why did my teacher say not to use black? And they never explained it, but the real reason that they probably meant is don't rely on black to darken a color because right. black has its own tinting. So if you mix, if you're darkening yellow with, bl with black, you're going to get green. And if, it makes a beautiful green, black and yellow. But right. Right. if you don't, let's say you're painting a lemon and you want it to go into shadow and you use black to darken it, it's going to look green, so you don't darken with green. You darken with a, a brown. But they were never that specific about it. They just said, don't use black. And, mm -hmm. and I think black is one of those colors that is, is a fantastic color. I, mm -hmm. I, you know, I have a little bit. I don't use it all the time. But it's a, it's a great color, but not, um, I'm saying this because of Goya, because I always say, what would have Goya done without the color black? You know? mm -hmm. Well, the, you know, there's one artist, who is it? I forget his name. He, he, was, he was one of the Brits that won whatever that BP award uh, a couple years back. And he did this incredible photorealistic painting with three colors, blue, black, Mars violet, and uh, titanium white. Mm -hmm. And he got an incredible range of colors, it blew me away, you know? Anyway, guys, I'm gonna have to jump. Uh, All right, but I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna sign I'm gonna off here soon. Anyway, by the way, and uh, Chris. So, uh, um, anyway, we'll we'll talk, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, so, thank, real thanks. quick in closing, yeah. I wanted to tell you all that I'm gonna be doing a scrapbook. If you all want to send anything you want to post on there, like teasing your future projects, Zoila, mm -hmm. <laughs> like uh, comic book pics, or like I'm I'm posting Wellington's new painting, and uh, I think Costa's gonna. Ha uh, uh, eventually, I'm going to have a, um, a permanent collection uh, developing as well. But I'm going to keep this show up as a permanent collection and keep the shows up as permanent collections as well. But uh, any photographs you all want to send me or anything okay. you want to share, we'll be posting it in this scrapbook on, on this website as well. Great. But, uh, I think that's pretty much it. It's been about an hour. And I think uh, everyone got a chance to get to know some of the artists. And yeah. And shout out to Bonnie who DeWitt, who of course could shout out to Bonnie be here. Wonderful, and, uh, wonderful, uh, bizarre artist. She was a lovely uh, lady. Yeah, and Zoila, definitely you have the fear, but have courage after the fear. Okay. You Thank know? you. And and definitely start thinking about posting and doing that. You know, it, it's probably going to be more positive than you think. Your feedback. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just just so you know, Zoila, like you stood out to me in a sea of students to, to put, in, I mean, if you still even consider yourself a student, which after a while you start transcending that, the way you think about yourself. Uh, and I think you're on the verge of uh, transcending that in your own mind. So that would, I mean, but you stood, your work's very strong. And it stood Thank out you, to Chris. me, I, I love that. I always, I always that, feel that artists are students until they die. Yes. Because you see stuff all the time and you want to, figure out how they did it you know every I, like john said i've been working in sotheby's since 2001 and i'm blown away every time i go through an exhibition yeah it's, it's humbling you'll see, you'll see something like it could be 2000 years old and you're wondering how the hell they did that <laughs> yeah. you know at that time how they did that how do they finish a, a piece of marble or, or a sculpture how do they do it you know so i feel about your water mind boggling <laughs> And uh, yep. that's what I've been doing a lot. It's Chris. I've been telling you, I've been geeking out because I've been doing these kind of uh, remote classes. And I've been lecturing. And mm -hmm. so the, the fun part for me is that I kind of research. Uh, right now I'm researching. I want to do, a, I'm doing a lecture on Hans Holbein, the younger. So I'm doing mm -hmm. all this. So 
it's i mean i i it's it's like you said that matt that uh it's so true it's like you're forever a student i mean right costa you know, can, yeah. can i ask you a question about did so yeah. when i heard about holbein's technique was that he sometimes i mean i know there was optical things he did yeah. but one of them was a sheet of glass in front of the model that he would trace he would he would do he would do that to two-dimensional linear but he also the other thing too it's like when you're talking about one thing that he did a lot he worked he worked on paper, mounted the paper on 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 a panel, and and he used shellac as as the ground and and um, as as both a, a size and ground. Hmm. And oh. all I'm saying, the reason I'm saying that is that, well, of course the materials back then, but when you look at Holbein's today, you look at the great Holbein. Well, there's two, but the one on Sir Thomas More and the Frick. Right. Nothing. I mean, it is pristine. It's pristine. fucking pristine. Wow. You think he used you know? for that one as a size? Yeah, and the, you know, the whole bind that, oh, I mean, all the whole binds blow me away, but uh, the ambassadors at the, um, yeah. in London. Yeah. With the, with, the skull, with the skull, the skewed skull, is that sick or what? Right, and that's a, that's a real optical distortion that he must have been playing with the camera and just going, oh, that works. Yeah. What, what? I mean, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, amazing, amazing. Anyway, all right, guys, nice, uh, and, uh, nice, Matt, nice to, nice to, nice to meet you. you. And, and nice meeting you, Matt and Zola. We'll, we'll, we'll see each other, I guess, speak to each other soon. And, and Chris, thanks a lot for setting it up. It looks great, by the way. Thank you all. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Right. The show looks great. Yeah, everybody. And it'll be up in a week. Permanent. Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks right. a lot. Good night. Have a Thank good you. Week. Nice to meet everybody. Okay. Bye, Chris. Bye, Matt. Bye. 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 See you. Bye, Costa. Bye, Bye everyone.